We ponder about life and reality, and we ask questions about meaning of existence. How do you explore ideas so vast, scattered across science, philosophy and faith, without getting lost? We need a method, a way to connect ideas, uncover meaning and navigate the plethora of knowledge and history. At entirety of everything, we're truly inspired by the character of Sherlock Holmes, a mind that notices what others miss and strings those fragments together into a symphony of insights. That inspiration led us to develop a method of our own, the art of deduction. I looked you up on the internet last night. Anything interesting? Found your website, the science of deduction. Very similar, you see but for the real world. A way of observing carefully, connecting thoughtfully, and deducing insights from seemingly unrelated facts. An approach that connects science, philosophy, and theology, not just to speculate, but to seek facts that matter. Not just to see, but to observe. But what has this got to do with that painting? I don't see. But you do see, you just don't observe. All right, all right. Go. And today, we'll show you how it works. Let's take an everyday object, your smartphone, and deduce how it truly came to exist, not by jumping to one inventor's name, but by tracing the chain of discoveries and ideas that made it possible. Ready? Let's begin. This device, the modern smartphone, is far more than plastic, glass, and a screen. It's a symphony of technologies. But what lies inside? Your phone runs apps, takes photos, connects to the world. But what drives it? At its core lies a microprocessor, a tiny chip performing billions of calculations every second. Without it, your phone is just a paperweight. And that chip, it's made of millions of microscopic switches called transistors, the basic building blocks of digital logic. To fit those transistors onto a wafer of silicon, we needed the science of microfabrication the ability to etch circuits thousands of times thinner than a human hair. And those transistors don't work alone. They're organized into logic circuits, built from logic gates, which follow strict rules of digital encoding using ones and zeros to process information. But before we could build machines that process logic, we needed a way to conceive of computation itself. That's where Alan Turing comes in. In the 1930s, he imagined a theoretical, universal machine capable of solving any problem through a series of logical steps. His idea laid the conceptual foundation for all modern computing, turning pure logic into programmable instructions. And during World War II, this wasn't just theory. Turing helped crack Nazi Germany's Enigma machine, a complex encryption device once thought unbreakable. To do this, he helped build one of the first actual digital computing machines capable of rapidly testing thousands of possibilities using binary logic. It was the birth of practical computation, where abstract logic met real hardware. At the heart of today's logical circuits are transistors, which act as tiny on-off switches, making Turing's vision possible. But what allows transistors to function? What makes all this possible at the physical level? That's where solid-state physics comes in, the science of how electrons move through solid materials like silicon. Yet at the deepest level, none of this would work if electrons behaved the way classical physics predicted. Which brings us to one of the most remarkable theories in science, quantum mechanics. Theory that explains the unseen world of the subatomic particles. At the heart of every modern electronic device lies this strange counterintuitive theory describing a world where particles exist in probabilities, where energy levels jump in tiny steps, and where light behaves both like a wave and a particle. Physicists like Heisenberg, Schrödinger, and Dirac built the mathematical framework of quantum mechanics. But how did this theory come to be? Let's keep our deductions going. 
Classical physics, the physics of Newton and Maxwell, explained the everyday world beautifully. But as scientists began probing deeper, they found cracks in its predictions. Light, for instance, sometimes acted like a wave, other times like a stream of particles. Atoms didn't emit smooth spectrum of colors as predicted by classical physics, but instead released discrete, sharp lines. It was Niels Bohr who proposed a bold explanation that electrons orbit the nucleus in fixed energy levels, and these spectral lines appeared when electrons jumped between them. Bohr's solution to the atomic spectral line problem rested on the explanation of the photoelectric effect. In one such experiment, a gold leaf electroscope was used, a metal plate charged with electrons. When blue or ultraviolet light was shined on the plate, it caused electrons to be ejected, discharging the leaf. But red light, no matter how intense, had no effect at all. This defied classical logic. If light is just a wave, increasing brightness should eventually knock electrons loose. But it didn't. Enter Albert Einstein. He proposed something revolutionary, that light is made of discrete packets of energy, photons. Only photons with enough energy, like those from blue light, could free an electron. And for this very insight into the quantum nature of light, Einstein was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1921. Einstein's idea of the photon was built upon one pivotal discovery. In 1900, Max Planck faced a problem no one could solve. Why heated objects emitted light in specific colors at different temperatures. In a moment of boldness, he proposed something radical. That energy isn't continuous. It comes in tiny, indivisible amounts he called quanta. This simple, revolutionary mathematics cracked open a door no one even realized existed. It was the first clear sign that nature, at its smallest scales, isn't smooth, but granular. That energy, like matter, is built in tiny, distinct units. An abstract idea about invisible energy packets became the very foundation of our digital world. It's a reminder that the greatest discoveries often begin with a stubborn question and the courage to imagine that the universe might not work the way we always believed. Now, let's quickly fast forward back to today. Planck's idea of quantized energy helped Einstein explain the photoelectric effect, showing that light isn't just a wave, but a stream of particles called photons. Building on that, Niels Bohr proposed that electrons orbit the nucleus in fixed energy levels, finally explaining why atoms emit sharp lines of color not a continuous spectrum. These breakthroughs, along with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, Dirac's and Schrödinger's equation, laid the foundation of quantum mechanics, a new physics of the very small. That theory made possible the invention of the transistor, a tiny switch that controls electron flow with astonishing precision. But to truly harness the power of transistors, we needed a blueprint for thinking. Alan Turing imagined a universal machine one that could perform any calculation using simple binary logic. Transistors gave rise to logic gates, which followed Turing's model, breaking complex tasks into binary decisions. These gates were assembled into logic circuits, then microprocessors. And with advances in microfabrication, we shrunk billions of these tiny components onto chips just millimeters wide. We shrunk these transistors to just three nanometers wide, packing billions of them into the chips that power the smartphone in your hand. So, we can conclude all this into a single understandable statement. That is, the explanation of the quantum world and the behavior of subatomic particles is the basis of our entire digital world and made the device possible on which you are watching this video today. This is the art of deduction. Starting from what we know, tracing it backwards, revealing the hidden connections and gaining clarity. And this is the approach we'll use in the episodes to come. We will deduce and connect science to faith, technology to philosophy, reason to revelation, because in these connections lies the truth, the truth of existence. But hang on, what if we kept deducing backwards from Max Planck? It's very simple. 
If we keep deducing anything that happens in this world, we ultimately reach the beginning of our universe. Everything that happens in this world, every event, discovery, thought, and moment, is only possible because this universe exists to host it. Every cause we trace, every effect we observe, ultimately, depends on the existence of the universe itself. This is the principle of causality, that every effect must have a cause. And if everything is caused by something else, it leads us to the most important question and our ultimate reality. Why does this universe exist and what might be the purpose of its existence? Let us know in the comments below how often do you wonder about this and what do you think is the purpose of your existence. Thank you for watching entirety of everything.